Test here. Hi, Linda. Morning, everybody. Just wanted to let you know if in your group at your table you're short of chairs, we've got a few on a rack over there, so you can grab some to fill them in if you need it. Yes. Yep.
Well done. Well done. That's pretty impressive. Good job. Oh, that's great. Oh, it is. That's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. Welcome.
Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's seven o'clock here, you know. <laughs> About three minutes, about three minutes, we'll get started. All right. I'm not used to these early beginnings, you know, when we shorten the service a little bit. So kind of nice. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> so as, as we get going this morning, any prayer requests? Any prayer requests? I forgot a writing utensil, so I have to trust my memory. 
Yeah. John, sure. Thanksgiving, absolutely. As you undergoing treatment and so forth, so far going very well. So absolutely we will. John? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, yeah. So Howard and B. Waldschmidt are Debbie's, where's Debbie? She's tending to things. Uh, Debbie's folks, and they had been members here and away for a little while, and, and they're, they're back now living in, they're at Woodlands, right? They're out at Woodlands. So we're doing our best to get to see them as the Woodlands allow. <laughs> but keep them in your prayers, and we'll all keep them in our prayers. Okay. A couple sneaking in, and then we'll begin with prayer. No, I'm starting early. I told you it's it's uh it's the short services. I I don't know. I I wait till I see you walking outside, and then eggs are coming. Now let's <laughs> let's start early. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we again thank you for this opportunity to be here. Uh, this year, maybe it's at a time when it, it helps us see that it's easy to take it for granted. And we're so thankful just that we can do this. Thank you. We ask that you would uh, continue to be with John Hawkins, and we give you thanks, Lord, that, that you have blessed the, the treatment that he has received so far. Continue to be with it. Guide him. We thank you for bringing Howard and B. Walshman back to us and ask that you would continue to bless them. All these things we pray in your name and bless our study this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are on lesson two of God's providence. And as I told you before, when it's a quote-unquote can study, I usually jump around a little bit. and might insert some of my own questions and so forth. So if I ask a question that's not on here, don't, don't be surprised or confused. The title of this lesson today is God Preserves Us by Directing Our Steps. And why don't, you, why don't we just read together that uh, quotation from Psalm 16 right there behind us. Ready? Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. Okay. So you can see the goals for us today to trust that God gives us direction and then to take God's providence to heart and keep from worrying. That first one, that direction part, I think that's going to generate a lot of discussion this morning because it, it pertains to that whole thing of how much control does God assert in all of the details of my life versus do I have any say in what happens in the path of my life? That ends up sometimes being a very tricky question to answer and want to spend some time with that this morning. So a little bit of a teaser to start with. Um, maybe you don't think it is, but you hear this a lot, right? Life is like a journey. Maybe you say life is a journey. How so? How so? How so? Give me one detail. Okay. That as much, maybe I'll put it this way. I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but as much as you plan, there are going to be some turns that you didn't expect. <laughs> okay. Journeys are like that, aren't they? Oh, detour. Okay. How else is life maybe like a, a journey? Oh, good, good. There's a destination. Uh, we're, we're trying, we're looking to get somewhere. It's not just Travel for travel's sake. We're on our way somewhere. Very good. How else? Yeah. Yeah, good. It has a beginning and an end. Yep. It's got its high points and it's got its low points, right? There's the grand mountain views and there's stopping at the pit toilets, right? You, you catch your, 
your high points, your low points. Those are excellent. All of those, I, I think a very good analogy. Life is like a journey, isn't it? You think of, of most journeys you've taken in your life, you're trying to get somewhere and the journey is fun and there's maybe beautiful things to see along the way. And yet still, you don't turn around halfway through the journey and go home unless something or, you know, or it will happen, but you want to get to the destination. You get a flat tire, right? <laughs> so all of those things make life somewhat like a journey. This one I'll throw out there. I won't spend as much time on it, but how is it like traveling through a large mansion with many hallways, doors, and rooms? Yeah, Chris. Okay, there, yeah, there are lots of choices, aren't there? Lots of choices along the way. Where will I go? Which you pertaining? You can get lost, good. You can get lost. Okay. You might spend one time, uh, more time in one room than another. You might like one room more than another. Yeah. You might make right and wrong decisions. Yeah, you might make a decision that you realize, yeah, I wish I had gone upstairs <laughs> and I went into the basement. Okay, good, good. Ah, kind of true, you get what, it's one shot. Right? Can't really do the journey over again. <laughs> the roof could cave in. Very unexpected things could happen. You know, the twist again, twist and turns all the way. I'm going to have to get myself a music stand that stays up. <laughs> and my, all my musicians would say, yes, you need to get music stands that don't fall down. See why. Okay. God preserves us by directing us. This is where I think we're going to have some conversation about uh, how does it work exactly? Let's read together Jeremiah 10, 23. Ready? I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for man to direct his steps. How does that one catch you at first read? It almost seems like the Bible here is teaching what, Andy? Fatalism. You know, you know what fatalism is? We're, we are just, we're just puppets. We're just pawns. We're like the pieces on a chessboard. We have no say, control, anything on what we do. And then what, what conclusion do you come to or what? What action or inaction in life, if we were a true fatalist, might that lead to? If that was our, our true belief, that we have no say, nothing we can do one way or another, we're just the pawn, what do you think the effects might be as we would live life? How would that change the way we live life? Tom? Okay, you, you wouldn't plan anything, right? Well, what's the point? I could plan all day long, but what's going to happen is going to happen anyway. How else might that affect life? It could, it, it could end up really being a validation or excuse for laziness, couldn't it? It, it very much could. It could also... Sure, right? Well, sin, that's just what I was programmed to do. Ooh, does that sound a little familiar? Yeah, okay. So while I don't think there are many true, diet hard, absolute fatalists in the world, a little bit of fatalism, I think, does creep in very much in what we do. But if you were a true, diet in the wool fatalist, might it also be kind of depressing? I mean, you just you probably go through life with that woe is me attitude. Oh, there's nothing I can do. Oh, my life is miserable, but I guess God just wanted it to be that way. Yeah.
So it's being shared as, as kind of where we're going with this study and that is, well, if God, if it's not fatalism, then how does God interact? What's, what is God doing? And to what degree does he, quote unquote, leave us, my quotes, what I'm saying, leave us to do what we want to do. And so we kind of want to, that's the road we want to go down this morning and explore a little bit more. You see that bullet point there? Some have made the comparison. How is the, the Lord like a parent helping to, helping a young child to walk? The young child, when that's just starting out, would you say the child is what? You know, when they teeter those little steps, would you say they're walking? Kind of. What does a parent do? Yeah, guides them, guides them. And yet, does that child have a little bit of, we're going to go this way. I'm learning the stance of staying in front of the camera while I teach. The child has a little bit of a, you know, a controller say, and, and often, right? Maybe you're teaching that little kid to walk and they look over and they see their favorite little toy and they go, this may be mom and okay, we'll go along to the little toy. But if they go, ooh, the fireplace. Just mom and dad, oh, I guess the child wants to go to the fireplace. Let's go to the fireplace and touch it. We wouldn't do that, would we? Dorothy. So, so often I think a parent is, is a, a great analogy to help us understand God too. Of course, we acknowledge we're all imperfect parents, but the love for a child that a parent has and what they're trying to do, when we think of God in those terms, I, I just think we buck a little bit less against what he wants us to be doing because we understand, oh yeah, I'm kind of like that as a mom or dad too. Yeah. Proverbs 3 verse 6, let's read that one together. In all your ways, trust him, and he will make your paths straight. Solomon tells us God will make our paths straight. You find an example of this in Isaiah 45. He made King Cyrus way straight by governing and directing things so that Cyrus releases the Jews from captivity. Making the past straight. I want to back up even further. I don't know that that's something that resonates with us all that much, as much as it would resonate from someone who lived during that time. I'll use one personal example. When I was between high school and college, I went with, uh, with three friends and we worked in Alaska for the summer. I probably told you some silly stories about that summer. But we drove the Alaska-Canada Highway. Does anyone know the story of, of how and when that was built? I heard it over there. Yeah, Tom? World War II. World War II. And why was it built? Yeah, tra transportation out to, to Alaska, just in case. We were invaded. Okay. We want to build a road so we can get our troops there in case Alaska is invaded. So we got to build it fast. What's the fastest way to do it? Well, actually straight is not the fastest way to do it. Yeah, you avoid blasting, you know, bl bl having to blast through mountains. You avoid having to, yeah, drain lakes and things like that. And so it's a very curvy road. It goes through mountain passes, the natural passes that are there. For a lot of it, it goes alongside the rivers that naturally keep you on a fairly level plain all the way through. It's curvy and windy and curvy and windy and curvy and windy. It's like driving a Wisconsin rustic road the whole time. If, if you don't do well with uh, car sickness, you wouldn't have wanted to drive it. Now, <laughs> since then, it's interesting. There's, if you ever do Alaska, Tom could tell you the mile post marker book, right? Yeah. Yeah, they did it in nine months when they built it. There's this book called the mile post marker that you're supposed to use when you go on Alaska Highway because there's a little post at every mile. Every year, the Alaska-Canada Highway gets shorter. Why? Because they're straightening it out. They're blasting through some of those mountains now. They're 
uh, taking the, the places where you went way, way over because you had to avoid this giant lake over here. You know, larger bridges are being built. So the path is made straight so that the transportation is much easier. The journey is, is a lot less difficult. For an Israelite too, in a time before blasting through mountains and all of those things, you know, uh, I'll give another Alaska example. The city of, uh, not Seward, what's the other one? Whittier, Whittier. You can only get to by going through this tunnel that they blasted through a mountain. And otherwise, it would take you hours to get there. Or you would have to go out on the ocean and around to get there. Going through the tunnel takes you 10 minutes maybe. You can see how people who had to travel on foot or with animals and so forth would, would appreciate the value of a straight path. That's the context I wanted to lay down as we look at a passage that God talks about God making the paths straight for us. Now I want to use the example that's listed there. Cyrus, what do you know about Cyrus? Cyrus. What did he do? What's he famous for? Yep. Yeah, he allowed he allowed the Jews to return from exile in Babylon. Another tidbit about Cyrus. Isaiah. It's why. Critics of the Bible hate the book of Isaiah. Pastor Hay. Isaiah prophesied way ahead of time that Cyrus, not just some king of Persia, but Cyrus by name would be the one. And he was. He was the one whom God used to allow the Israelites to go back to the promised land a thing that would have been unthinkable only years before because people would have seen it as a threat. There's no way we're letting the Jews go back to Jerusalem. They always rebel. But God made the path straight. Yeah, a little. You're remembering Nehemiah. Well, Nehemiah didn't pay for it. No, Nehemiah asked for money and goods from a bunch of other people. And yeah. Not only did the Israelites go back, they kind of paid for them to go back. Pretty nice. Well, whose hand is behind all this again? You know, God's. God's. Psalm 77, verse 20. Let's read together. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Okay, another picture, isn't it? Of how, you understand that that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to answer this question. How does God interact with us in life? To what degree is he just asserting absolute control? Um, Noah Walta must do this tomorrow. Versus how much is he simply using the choices and the things that people do to carry out the plans that he has? How is the Lord's directing the people of Israel in the wilderness like a, a shepherd leading his flock? So how does this example play out? In, now we're starting with Israelite history, shepherd and flock. How's that working? Moses and Aaron. That's the time frame. Dorothy. Yeah, it, it guides them where to go, so they're not going to see all those things. Now, along the way, were there threats? We used that word last class, threats. Were there threats? Could you imagine being one of the Israelites? And you're, you're we got to go fast because, oh, did you hear the Egyptian army is coming? They're in their chariots. Uh-oh. Rock, 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 rock. 
and there is just, you see on the horizon, this mass of water. What's going through your mind? We're goners. We're done. Yeah. So his presence is there to comfort them, right? To, to know. Um, go back to, I don't want to get into today's politics. I just don't want to go there right now. So let's go back to 9-11. And one, one of the first things that was maybe concerning to people, and now that you, you, know, you can watch the documentaries of, of how the, the day unfolded, was what, what did they do with the president? They bunkered him first, and then they they bunkered him in a bunker. But they also kind of bunkered him where, in Air Force in Air Force One. And it, it's fascinating to to in retrospect, kind of read the interplay between the president and those who wanted to protect him. There was a recognition on his part: the longer that no one knows where I am, what's true. People get scared. Yeah, Barb. Yeah, they're going to think I abandoned. They're going to think something's wrong. They're going to think there's there's no one at the top who's everyone's afraid. Even the president is hiding from it. There must be worse to come. You, you can see how the presence, right? The presence of a leader reassures people. Reassures people. So the presence of God being there was something that reassured the people as their shepherd. He's there to protect them from danger when danger comes in that way. He's like a shepherd. Chris? Can we call that patience and dedication that so many, so many times they're fickle, if you want to use that word, and they, they rebel again, and they forget the last time that God got them out of it, and they just uh, but God, with his ever-loving patience, is there to continue them. If you know anything about sheep, boy, it's, a, it's a good analogy, but one that's not often all that flattering. <laughs> okay. Yes, Tom. Yeah. Good, good example of how when their when their physical leader wasn't present, Moses and Aaron, they run away. Golden Gen. Oh, another picture, huh? Tour guide. Is that a good analogy? Is that... I'm not going to let Tom and Janie answer that question. Maybe someone throw out a, a yeah, no, or someone throw out a yeah, kind of. What does a tour guide do? Andy? <laughs> okay, good, good. So, yeah, Andy is saying a little bit like a tour guide. They have things planned out for you. They have the journey, the itinerary, and yet you have some choices along the way. You could also choose just to completely disregard the tour guide, couldn't you? Couldn't you? That never happens, does it? <laughs> you could do that. Um, Dorothy? Very good. You know what? I, I'm going to start to give the guy who wrote this more compliments than I did before, because I think this is a good question. Um, a tour guide, it, it, it does help us see that a tour guide often is there more than anything for the enjoyment and the entertainment of the one that paid for the tour guide to be there to, to get them through the tour. That is not God's 
God's purpose. Sometimes maybe we like to think that, but that isn't how God operates. Um, is the tour guide there to get them to their destination? Somewhat, yes, but it's more to show them things along the way, even at the ultimate destination. Um, so some yeses and some noes, but maybe a, a good a good way to help us really start to dive in a little bit too. Uh, Lord is there. This one now plunges us right into it. Agree or disagree, some events in life are determined by luck or chance. <laughs> <laughs> are we are we in Vegas, John says? <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Zahn. I I never went to cross before. Uh my seminary. There's no such thing as a pinball. Well there's luck, yeah. Yeah. So no. And yet, let's go back to the fatalism question. Does that mean God has every single activity and action predetermined yes. from the get-go? Uh -huh. Okay. Not simply a matter of chance, there are choices. God does not predetermine every single detail of how things are going to happen. Are there some things, though, that God has predetermined? Give some examples. Okay, nature, uh, we, we don't really choose when the earthquakes happen, do we? And yet we wouldn't say these are simply a matter of chance. God does determine those things. But when I say predetermine, I, I want human events. Think, uh, does God predetermine any human events? Birth of okay. your child. Our, our birth and our death? Yep, yep. Hmm. Baptism. I, I want to be careful with that. Does, does a parent, can a parent choose not to baptize? Yeah, but when I would look at my own case, has God chosen to bring me to faith? Yeah. Um, how about the big one in the Bible? What the Bible is the story of? How God sent the Messiah into the world, right? So predetermined that his Messiah would come. Was it absolute? Was it an absolute predetermination that? The particular soldier that nailed the cross and that nailed the, the nail in Jesus left. What was that particular soldier? I think we would be fearful to tread on that ground of going in that direction. And yet, the result of Jesus' crucifixion, the suffering, death, and burial, that's predetermined. There are certain events that are predetermined. How do we know which ones those are? Huh? Yeah. Where'd you learn that from? Where'd I learn that from? Ah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. And that really is the answer, the predetermined ones we find in the Bible. Now, there may be some that God has predetermined that he hasn't told us about. You know, for some of those in the Bible, in retrospect, we know that God predetermined them, but maybe he didn't make that completely known to all of the people at that time. And finally, right, did Adam and Eve know that a man named Jesus Christ would die in a tree? Well, did they know God was going to fix the problem they made? Yep. Jenny. Oh, oh. Good question. And I'm, I'm teaching, I'm teaching Reformation history in eighth, in eighth grade catechism right now. And the question Janie asked is, was Martin Luther predetermined? I don't think we can say that from a biblical perspective, a man named Martin Luther, what is fulfilled by the Lutheran Reformation? 
my words will not return to me empty, but will, Pastor Don? Yeah, right? The, the places in the Bible where God promises his word won't be taken away and his church won't die. That's predetermined. The particular players and how that ends out, there were some choices of people involved there, but God is there, right, guiding like walking the child along. It's interesting that you asked that one because I don't know if you're familiar with the words of, of, of Jan Hus. He was a reformer that came before a few hundred years. And while he was, legend has it, before or while he was being burned alive, his name meant goose, Hus, goose. He said, you're, roast, you're burning the goose, but 100 years from now a swan will come along and you won't be able to. I'm paraphrasing. And it was about that period of time that Martin Luther came. That's interesting. That's fascinating. But we would not take the step out and say that Jan Hus was God's prophet at that time. Yeah. All right, good. The end of the world is predetermined, isn't it? That, that time is also predetermined by God. But the answer to the question, what do we know is predetermined, where are we going to find it if it is in the Bible? Dorothy. Oh, great question. Pastor Haig preached a marvelous sermon on that subject. Yes. It, it, it's God's plan, and I'll paraphrase, and then Pastor Haig can tell me where I messed up in telling you what he so beautifully outlaid for you, because he did. That was a masterful sermon. Um, God, God never plans sin, right? What God promises is that he's going to get his will done in spite of sin. And oftentimes he's going to turn sin on its head to get done exactly what he wants to get done. Now, a person who has, you know, has been diagnosed with a, a disease or something says, I'm okay with that. It's all part of God's plan. I'm probably not going to immediately say, your theology's all screwed up. Because that might not be where they're coming at it from. What they might genuinely be saying is, I'm going to trust that God is going to use this in a way that's a blessing. And if we phrase it that way, that's true. I might just use a different way to describe it. I, I wouldn't use the words, this is God's plan for me. Um, God's plan for me is to keep me as his child and, and get me to heaven. God's plan for me is to use whatever comes along in my life in a way that I can continue trust him, in a way that will be a blessing to me and a blessing to others that are there. So you get into some pretty deep semantics, but that are a little bit important too, because they also start to go. I, there's another question and another phrase you hear a lot. God spoke to my heart and said, I just need, I know I need to do this now or make this decision now. What do we do with that? Tom. Uh, Tom's question is as well, was that after prayerful consideration? Let's, for the sake of argument, say that it was. Take that to its end and share where that might get you into kind of a prickly situation, Chris. <laughs> yeah. yeah be, be very careful Do, are there are there spiritual things 
for which, and rightfully so, we become very emotionally invested. Maybe, again, for the sake of argument or hypothetical, man, you know, we live up in the Holy Land now and there are, there are so many uh, members of our congregation, our church up there. Why don't we start a daughter congregation up there? And I could pray a lot about it and I just, I'm very emotionally invested of it. But when I, when I cross that line and now say, if I go before the congregation, tell them, you know, I've been praying about this for months and God has spoken to my heart and we need to open that daughter mission in the Holy Land. What have I now become? Without using those words, I am basically saying, I am scripture. God has spoken to me. It's his will. I have certainty of it because he spoke to my heart. And then, I don't think we have a Fred in our congregation. So then Fred gets up to the meeting and says, Pastor, I've been praying about this for a pretty long time too, and God spoke to my heart and he said, concentrate your efforts here, down in the valley. Dorothy. Tinge of arrogance can come there. Now, is it wrong for a friend or whoever to get up? I won't use myself because there's a pastoral side of that, that ethical pastoral side of it that probably wouldn't be wise to get up there and say something like this. But if it's a member of the congregation, I just feel passion. I've been praying about this a long time and I just feel passionately that we should start a mission up in home. Anything wrong with that? No. No. And nor is there anything wrong with Fred saying I passionately feel we should not do it. Um, how many of you were here when we, when they sold the property on Johnson Street and moved here? A lot of emotion. Did everybody think we should do it? No. Oh. In the end game, was it a choice of the congregation to do what it did? Yeah. Was God using those things to get his work done? Pastor Hayden. Call? Yeah. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you, you've, you've, you've kind of hit on one that makes me uncomfortable in a lot of settings, too. And that is understand that, yes, we call it a divine call for a reason, that God established the ministry and that God uses congregations to call his people. But do we sometimes contribute to that by the phrases and words we use almost as if, well, in this one situation where I, I'm, I'm considering ministry at one place or another, that's where the Holy Spirit directly speaks to me. And um, I, I won't go further than that, but yeah, I, I agree. I think sometimes we contribute to that. It's still a human decision. Now, again, is God going to use that decision even when it's tinged with sinfulness to carry out his desires? Yeah. I mean, can any of us say that, well, in that, in that four, eight weeks when I was considering a call, uh, there was no sinful thought involved at all in my decision making. I was holy for four weeks while I made that decision. No. Not true. <laughs> Not true. By the way, this is a great segue because I said I was going to introduce him earlier. <laughs> but I forgot to. <laughs> Pastor Pupal is with us this morning, sitting in the front row. Welcome, Pastor Pupal. <laughs> Pastor Pupal had no sin during those four weeks, by the way. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm on board with you there. I think sometimes it, it might be good for us to, at that level, sit down and just pair through that a little bit more. The, the caution we use and the kind of verbiage with the call that we don't make the call out to be a sacrament because it's not. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. 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 So there are human decisions, right? Well, how do we how do we go about making human decisions? Exactly what you just said. We do go to our Lord in prayer. We do go to the scripture, which, by the way, during the calling process, right, we do that. Or we apply passages of, of scripture. Um, Pastor Bufal, myself, Pastor Hugley, all have families. What's, God, what's God's directive to us as husbands and families? To put them first. Okay, so that plays into the whole decision-making process and doing a call and, and rightfully so. Um, yeah, th thank you, John, because that then takes us to that next step. First, we want to establish there are human decisions that are made. Be careful that we don't delve into that thought of when I involve God, that means that God will speak direct to, directly to me and make it 100% obvious exactly what he wants me to do, even to the point where I almost give the impression, you better not argue with this because this is God's decision through me. But now, okay, we've established that. Let's put that aside for a second. And John's point, okay, it's a human decision. Does that mean just do whatever makes me happy? No, we apply the principles in scripture for decision making and God gives those to us in the scriptures as well. So we do seek his guidance. We do look at the principles that he puts in place in the scriptures as we make those decisions. And then at the end, we trust even my decisions tinged with sin. God is a constant, God is patient. Just like he was long suffering with the Israelites, he will be long suffering with me, yes. Sure. The, the point made there was their experience isn't a bad thing to consider and use when we're making decisions. Knowledge, common sense, we might call it. We call, we bring those into play when we make decisions. That's not a bad thing. Chris. So, so you used a different phrase, which is God put this, put this on my heart. I think that one is maybe a little softer in that it says, I am the one that's considering this and wrestling with this and impassioned about this. Whereas, I, I know it seems like a subtle difference, but God spoke to my heart would seem to me, now you better do what I want to do because God said, versus I'm just really wrestling with this. I, you know, I, I feel like God has this in my life for a reason. And so, right? So our journey through life, it just decision-making versus God being in control. It, it sits in that, you wanna call it again, the narrow Luther middle road, that on the one hand, God has not predetermined every single detail and, and little thing in my life and yet God does promise to use all of those things and when it comes to the freedom I have to make decisions he's given me tools to go about making those decisions and I do the best I can to make them are there times when we just can't know exactly what God would have us do Isn't this one of them, right, as we wrestle with the pandemic or and what to do? There is so much that has been written, so much that has been said, so much that has been back and forth. You just feel, I can't even read it all. I can't. And as I said in the last class period, to be humble enough to, to say in the end game, I don't know. I don't know with absolute certainty. But in many of these places, we're put in a place where 
as a family member or as an institution with a church and school, a decision must be made. And so we do the best to use the tools, the scriptural principles, common sense, the information we have, and it's tricky because the information overwhelms us, right? To make a decision, which when we're completely humble and honest, we say, it might be wrong. I can't know. But I think that attitude of humility that in those circumstances where God has not made it abundantly clear to exercise great patience and humility with each other is what's in order. Pastor Zahn. Yeah, uh, that's talking about uh, small and decisions. Uh, yeah, you know, that he had a situation here in Haiti. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that that's, boy, oof. it's a really rough one. And, and if I were to do an akin, and I want to be careful because they're not complete parallels. So you're counseling with somebody who's in danger. And I say, Pastor, I just, if something isn't right here, I need to break the engagement. Um, sometimes they're, you're about to break a promise, granted, but maybe you're, you're realizing with the circumstances and the wisdom you have that it would be worse to keep that promise and set yourself up for a whole raft more sin. Go oh, away. Yeah. Tough. Okay. Now let's talk about worrying. <laughs> in this one. Luke 12, 7. Let's read it together. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. God really know how many hairs on our head? Yeah. Easy for some than others. <laughs> yeah. That's he does. Um, I'll just I'll just share that this passage is one that I come back to a lot. Just as a reminder, God knows. How often don't I get in my own little hole and worrying about or the kinds of decisions I was just talking about, or worrying about this, or worrying about that, and oh man, I gotta make sure. I, uh, and you're, you're just weighed down with this anxiety. And you just hear that beautiful passage. Hey, look outside at the sparrows. I've numbered the hairs on your head. What are you worrying about? I've got this. Does that mean there's going to be no hardship or pain ahead for me? No. But will God use those to his end? Yeah. First Peter 5, 7. Let's read again. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. How much anxiety should we place on the Lord's shoulders? All of it. How much could we carry ourselves? Oh, that's easy. I won't ever worry again. So what do we do with that? Where am I going with that sarcastic phrase? How can we help each other? How can we bless each other in applying this passage that we can read and know it's truth, but ends up being so hard to apply in our lives? Pastor Haig. John's name. Who? We can see you. John's pastor. <laughs> Yeah, you can see me. Yeah. Yeah. Faith. Mm-hmm. So, I know you have more, but just so everyone can catch up on what you said in here, and then I'll, I'll let you continue saying, there is a slipperiness to the word worry, and you're right. 
for instance, should we worry about how our kids turn out? Should Pastor Hague worry about uh, making sure he's got a good lesson plan for tomorrow? In the sense that he's concerned about doing a good job and concerned for the welfare of his children, absolutely. Now continue. Okay. Yeah. God isn't saying don't take your responsibility seriously, right? Uh, but as you said, to, to avoid that, that over fretting of, you know, oh no, if I don't get this exactly right, the world will come crumbling down around me. That's a little bit, actually, sometimes our worry is, a, that kind of worry is a little bit arrogant, isn't it? Do we really think it, it so all depends on us? No, God, God will see us. Good, good comment. Yeah, it's slipperiness of terms again. Okay. Isaiah 40. All right. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Imagine a painting based on that verse. You probably don't have to imagine it. There have been just hundreds and hundreds of paintings done of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. Anyone want to share their favorite? Yeah. Okay. Oops. Carrying the lamb in his arms and the other sheep are all around him. Have you seen the one where the sheep is carried across his back? One that illustrates the lost sheep, I think, is Jesus on a precipice or cliff, you know, grasping for the lost sheep. But past, they call those the, past, the pastoral, which right means shepherding, paintings. Yeah. Uh, kind of a reminder of another blessing, too, in, in the arts. What a cool gift God has given us to be able to express and share some of the reality of those passages that are there. Absolutely. Deuteronomy 33. Let's read that one. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are his everlasting arms. You know. When you read the Bible frequently, you, you, you come, come to appreciate its poetry more and more. And appreciate even the translators that managed to take Hebrew poetry and make it into English poetry. Uh, underneath are his everlasting arms. What a beautiful picture. How are God's everlasting arms like a giant safety net under a tightrope? Oh no, I messed up, Tom. Okay, he's always there, right? It's always, always there to catch him. Oh no, I messed up. What does that not mean? Yeah, you're, you'll be okay. Un unless you say, and I don't need no safety net, right? Then we're rejecting the God who's there, but there is, there is that safety net. And what a comfort. Because on life's journey, how many of us have taken a wrong turn or two or 300? Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah 41, 9 and 10. I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Many a confirmation passage and graduation passage in those verses. The reasons we have for being unafraid in the face of danger that are here in this passage. Yeah.
So his presence is there, right? And his, we might say his omnipresence. He, he's, there's no place we can go where he's not, other than to reject him. I will strengthen you. Andy? Uh, I'm wondering, how many Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the Where do the angels fit in? Andy asks. Um, so, God have to have angels? No. Yeah, part of His desire, the creation is there, and then as there's the fall into sin, and everything else. It, Hebrews, probably the most instructive, are not the angels ministering spirits. So he employs them as part of his plan to guide and protect. Uh, they do play in to him fulfilling what he says, right? That, that's, I think, where we would say the angels fit in. And in fact, this is an excellent place to talk about that because... It's there rather than the angels are, are kind of semi-gods, right, that we pray to or that can come and, and uh, do for us what God wouldn't do because they're a little bit closer to us and we have a little more in with the angels. No, they're ministering spirits. God's going to use them in accord with his plan for our blessing. There's some great artwork that's been done on that too. We have to be a little careful because it's people's interpretation but i always think those wasn't there one with little kids playing on a bridge <laughs> right yeah. and they could fall in and there's the angel behind them protecting does that answer the question Andy? yeah and always a little bit tough with angels because the bible doesn't say a ton. you know does each of us have a guardian angel like and it's a wonderful life doesn't seem that we do but are the angels guarding and protecting us absolutely they are yes I think I, I would stop at saying the angels carry out God's directives and without trying to get into, well, do angels have any free will to make one choice or the other? Bible says nothing about them, just not going to go there. The angels are there to, to carry out God's plans as, as he has them. Why is your baptism a guarantee that God will provide for you throughout your life? Because through your baptism, God did what? Yeah, chose you and took you into his family. Right. This, I, I, uh, let's go to Isaiah 46. Let's read that. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and will carry you. I will sustain you and will rescue you. How long does God's protection last? It's all your whole life. Yeah, all, all life long. Th this one, I think, really hits to what Pastor H shared before. Agree or agree, uh, to worry is a sin against the first commandment. It depends how you understand the word, right? If we're talking about taking our, our responsibilities seriously and maybe some of the, uh, the weight that we feel a little bit with that, that necessary, it isn't necessarily the, the kind of worry God is talking about here, but if we're talking about that excess fretting, that, oh no, uh, how will this ever come to a good end, or if I make the wrong decision, the world will come crashing down. Then we, is that a sin, would we call that a sin against the first commandment? In that case? Yeah, I think so, because, right, the trust, fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Comment? People are commenting. It's Bible class. Yeah, you're. Yeah. You're finding that sweet spot, right? Of, of, you know, knowing that God is there doesn't mean I don't take serious. 
Yeah, I don't have to worry about whether I get uh, that theological question exactly right with my eighth graders. They'll be fine because God is in control. No, it's a responsibility you have as a pastor to make sure that your you know, question theology is on the up and up when you do that. In fact, God says, right, if we're leading others into sin, good or bad, very bad. So taking, that ser taking God's command in that case seriously, I wouldn't classify that as the kind of you know, worrying that he's talking about here. But I think Pastor Hank did a good job of articulating that a few moments ago. Yep. Yeah. Um, I just think that it's just a direction. I don't know if you're going to say something about it. It's been so much called infidel about Christians that are in the world mm -hmm. outside the United States that are facing persecution. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think what you point out there, think of the people that are truly in physical danger because of their faith. Is there a shade of difference between being scared, <laughs> fearful, and worried? I, I don't know. It, I think it's one of those realms where you get into, if I were in that situation, you know, is there still sin involved in me not completely saying, yeah, God, I'm in your hands, whatever happens, happens. Yeah, I, my, I, I think that's, that's valid to say that. But by the same token, is, uh, is any kind of, we'll call it the fear of the unknown, by its very nature, sinful, or the fear of, of the pain that's coming, is that by nature in itself a sinful thing? I, I think I would, I would hesitate to tread there. You're again on that middle ground, but usually, I think in the situation, where are you going to go for your strength and help, even in that situation where you're battling fear or you're battling pain? You're still going to the, to the one who can give you the strength to get through that. Rather, rather than in that situation, oh, no, I'm doubly in trouble now because there's fear coming and I'm not completely trusting God anymore. No, go to, go to the one who's going to strengthen you in that circumstance and you know what that is. Yeah, yeah John, sorry. Yeah, uh, God, the persistent widow, right? She keeps coming and coming and coming, and finally her case is heard, and they give her justice. And Jesus' point in that is, be persistent with me. So when you look at, at those days and times when the fear part of anticipating what's coming is dominating what's going on, what a great place then to think of that parable and, and change the time change what our mind is occupied with instead of the fear to the prayer that God would be with and instruct and go or take that time to be in the scriptures. I can remember a particular time in my life when I was having some very big struggles in the college years and I put it mildly, I did what college kids did and messed up my circadian rhythm and ended up with insomnia, which you never appreciate sleep until you can't. Yeah, it's my mom who, who said, you know, one of the places, go to the Psalms, read the Psalms. That was just tremendously. And why? You go there and what do you see? People, uh, people crying out, just laying their hearts before God. You know, some of the words in the Psalms, you kind of go, oh, can you say that to God? Well, doesn't he know what you're thinking anyway? <laughs> right? Yes, you can say that to God because that's where you are right now. And have that quote unquote dialogue with him. And, and Psalms are like these roller coasters where, oh, I'm struggling. God, I know you're going to be there. You were in the past. I know you'll be in the, oh, I'm struggling. God, be with me. God, I know you were with me in the past and you'll be with me now. Oh, I'm struggling. Psalms, it's just like that. But what a great place of a reminder of how God does interact with his people and take care of them over a long haul. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Tom, we'll have to be our last one. Sure. 
Okay. I, 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 I will really struggle to do this in a few seconds, but because the topic was brought up, two, two things that you got to remember when you're dealing with that. Number one, okay. if a person in there, I'll just use the quote unquote words, right mind, takes their life as a rejection of God, and how would you know that? Oftentimes things like the note, the thing kind of things they were saying, thinking beforehand while still complete certainty isn't there of where their mind was at that moment, it would seem their actions are indicating I've died, my death is a rejection of God. But be very, very careful when you tread there. Uh, there is the thing that we know also as clinical depression, like your mind can be sick, like, I'm sorry, like your stomach, stomach can be sick, like your leg can be sick. You know, we know like with an Alzheimer's, right? A brain can be sick. Um, with depression, the brain can be sick too. And so in those circumstances, as a person may take his or her life, um, there, you know, the sad part is we're left with less of the certainty than we are other places, but but we hold out that, that hope. You know, I, really quickly, an example of a lady in my former congregation was a paranoid schizophrenic and became, you'll laugh, but it was very sad, became convinced that I was trying to poison her with copy or ink. And she wrote a letter saying, I want to quit the church. We didn't take her off the membership rolls. And if she had died that day, I still would have done her funeral and buried. Um, it, she had been taught the scripture. She had been baptized. You know, the mind was just in, a, in another place and, and another one of those, I don't know how that all works together. So that, that's where I'll leave that one, Tom. That certainly is, is food for a larger subject. And if anyone has particular questions, please come talk to me about it. But that's just hard. That's a hard one to try to answer completely in a couple of minutes. Okay. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, help us to continue to come to you, uh, to weigh the decisions that you give us in, in life, to, to make them with the counsel of your word, with prayer. At the end game, Lord, always to be content knowing that you're there by our side, guiding us with your presence to the end of our journey, our home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Oh, same again, if there's any that can help tear down, put the tables and chairs on the racks and in the room. Much, much appreciated. Yes. Mm -hmm.